Hey everyone, welcome to the Being Patient Podcast. I'm Deborah Kahn, founder of Being Patient. When my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, I decided to use my skills as a journalist in a different way. Frustrated by the lack of information on science and the inability to get different expert opinions, I decided to quit my job at the Wall Street Journal to create a better platform for people impacted by dementia. We are a community where news and information is created by our team of journalists. We ask tough questions and we simplify the science so that anyone can understand. We don't only cover disease, but delve into the latest research on what it takes to keep our brains healthy. We invite the experts and ask your questions. Here's today's podcast. I hope you enjoy it. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Being Patient Brain Talks. I'm Deborah Kahn, founder of Being Patient. Today, we're going to focus on MCI, mild cognitive impairment. A lot of you write to us when your loved one or your um, or you've just been diagnosed wondering, what does this all mean for the future? Or does this mean I'm going to get Alzheimer's? So we thought we would tackle this question um, head on with Emily Paylo. Um, she's from UCSF and she is a doctor there who is an expert on MCI. Emily, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Okay, now I am just going to say this is such a common, common question. Um, we hear when people are first diagnosed with MCI, um, and I have to say, doctors tend to give that diagnosis first, no matter what the situation is. That's very, very common. So let's just start with how do you diagnose MCI? And then we can go a little bit into its difference with, with dementia, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. I think, you know, this can be a really confusing term because Oftentimes, you know, physicians might not give a lot of background and context and, you know, to what this really is. So, you know, Deborah, you, you know, as you said, this is mild cognitive impairment. Um, and this term is really used to characterize a mild level of cognitive impairment. Um, and, and what does that mean exactly? So um, typically we have some criteria to determine, you know, what is mild um, versus what's more severe. And, you know, at the more severe stage, we would call that dementia. Um, both of those things characterize the severity of cognitive impairment, um, but uh, MCI is really defined by a mild level of cognitive impairment where you can still function independently. Um, and, um, you know, this means that maybe the person is noticing cognitive changes, maybe during an evaluation, we pick up on some mild difficulties during cognitive testing, whether that's comprehensive cognitive testing or a cognitive screener but um, that they can still function for themselves independently. And to determine this, cl clinicians like myself will often ask about um, things that we call instrumental activities of daily living. Um, and these really include things like managing finances, managing medications, being able to shop independently, um, preparing meals, completing household hold chores, um, navigating transportation and getting places independently. And um, so, you know, if there's evidence of cognitive impairment, but you can still do all of those things independently, then the person's cognitive difficulties are characterized at this level of mild cognitive impairment or MCI. And okay. then if there's, yeah. Oh yeah, go ahead. No, I was just gonna ask. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why our memory doesn't function as well as it did. I mean, normal aging, you know, some people when they're having hormonal fluctuations during a menopause. When we think of MCI though, is that like when you enter dementia, you're, it's a point of no return or are you in this gray area where, okay, you're having mild cognitive impairment, things could get better? Yeah, yeah. So. I, I do think it's a gray area and it really depends on what your, your doctor is thinking, what is the cause of the MCI? As you're describing, lots of things can cause cognitive change. Um, you know, some of which are pretty normal, just like normal aging. Um, age is related with a lot of declines in functioning that are pretty typical. Um, but there are other things that can cause cognitive changes, you know, and MCI. Um, that are related to disease, one of which being Alzheimer's disease, 
There are lots of other neurodegenerative diseases that can cause MCI um, and other health conditions as well, things like stroke um, and other forms of cerebrovascular disease. Um, but it, you know, the, the course will really depend on what is the underlying cause of those changes. So as you described, things like hormonal fluctuations, sometimes even people are having difficulties with sleep that really affect their cognition. Um, sometimes there's imbalances in vitamins and other metabolic processes. And when those things are underlying the MCI, those have potential to be treated. Um, and sometimes people can see an improvement or um, at least stability. Um, you know, yeah. How do you tell the difference? A, a patient comes in and says, I'm experiencing some memory issues that are outside the norm. Are they treated like people who you may think have dementia, given those, you know, those preliminary screenings, like the MOCA test? Like, tell us about that diagnostic process. Yeah, there, there's lots of different uh, forms of evaluation and lots of different tests that we can give to, to try to tap into what is causing this MCI. Um, so I'm a neuropsychologist. Um, and what that means is that I'm, you know, in, in the clinic, I'm the one who's administering cognitive tests and interpreting people's performance um, on these different cognitive tests. We tap into all sorts of cognitive functions like memory, attention, processing speed, language, um, executive functioning, which is really complex, um, you know, collection of higher order thinking skills. Um, and based on people's performance in all of these domains, people have different patterns of strengths and weaknesses. And some patterns uh, indicate, you know, a higher likelihood that it may be caused by a neurodegenerative disease. Other patterns, for example, might indicate that things may be, um, you know, their weaknesses might be caused by other maybe more treatable things like sleep or depression. Um, and in addition to that, you know, I work really closely with neurologists who are the people who more closely manage the long-term care of our patients. And they'll often order additional evaluations and diagnostic tests. For example, um, you know, getting a brain scan, brain MRI, um, a blood draw or a lumbar puncture to examine you know, what proteins are existing in these uh, fluids that we have that can indicate whether or not a disease is present. So you're talking about things like plaque um, or- Exactly. Yeah, like exactly. beta amyloid plaque, which we know is a beginning hallmark, a hallmark for Alzheimer's. Um, okay, so I, I have a question. I kind of want to flip it around. So we hear from a lot of people um, that, you know, they, they've received, and, and honestly, it's almost like, few. it's MCI, and it's not the dementia or Alzheimer's world, word, right? Um, but there's a lot of confusion over what exactly does this mean? So how, I'm going to flip the question around, as a doctor, what would make you give someone an Alzheimer's diagnosis early stage versus MCI, or would that just not happen? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we can absolutely, you know, when we see someone make informed and educated hypotheses that would lead us to say, okay, we think this is MCI due to Alzheimer's disease. And those types of things um, would be, you know, the collection of all the things that I just mentioned, right? For example, you know, um, Alzheimer's disease most commonly manifests as difficulties with memory. Um, it doesn't always actually, you know, so we wanna be aware of those things too. Sometimes it can manifest as difficulties primarily with executive functioning or even visuospatial problems, but most commonly it would be difficulties with memory. Um, so, you know, if, if I'm seeing a patient and I see that on their neuropsychological testing, their primary difficulty is in memory, and maybe there's some weaknesses in other domains as well. Um, and then I pair that with other findings. For example, you know, on MRI, one of the brain regions that most commonly is associated with memory difficulties in Alzheimer's disease is our uh, hippocampus, or you know, also within the medial temporal lobe. So if we see damage to that area on a brain MRI in conjunction with memory problems on testing then we have more evidence to say this is likely due to AD. Um, and then on top of that, you know, we'll order these additional diagnostic tests through the blood or the cerebral spinal fluid looking for Alzheimer's disease proteins. And then at that point, we can say, okay, 
we really have evidence to, to say that this MCI might be due to, to Alzheimer's disease. So the scan is a tricky one because, you know, obviously, I mean, now there's blood tests, but those aren't usually available to the general public unless um, they are participating in a trial. Uh, I know some um, clinics are using them now, but it's not, it's not mainstream yet, right? There's still yeah. very new technology. Um, so, you know, we have been told that PET scans are the best way or a spinal tap to determine whether or not there's plaques and tangles, right? And that's, that was, that, that was kind of the gold standard. And we'll, we're watching this, the, the space of blood tests. But I've always been curious about an MRI because that's kind of like the first line of screening. So what exactly are you looking for in that MRI that will say, oh, you know, I mean, because don't our brains all kind of atrophy as we age a little bit? So what's what's the difference between, oh, wow, this is dementia and, oh, this is just normal aging? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really great, great question. And it, it also depends on who's looking at this brain MRI, too. The first person who usually looks at a brain MRI is a radiologist, and they're looking for really glaring issues, things like, you know, a tumor or um, other abnormalities. Um, and then when it gets to the neurologist, especially at a specialty dementia clinic, they um, have a much, uh, you know, higher level of detail to look at these patterns of atrophy. And you're right, absolutely. When, uh, you know, as a person ages, there's going to be, um, you know, more atrophy or decreased tissue in the brain in general, because that's just what happens with aging. Um, but seeing, um, you know, sort of a holistic view of the brain and seeing that some parts are more atrophied than you would expect, given sort of the rest of the global atrophy in the context of their age, that really hints to a neurologist um, that something extra is happening in there that is not just due to normal aging. So for example, you know, even if the, the brain has sort of general atrophy, but those medial temporal lobes, you know, those hippocampi are doing much worse than the rest of the brain, then that, that can be a sign. That actually is a really great answer. I, I, I wasn't thinking of it that way, um, but thank you for that. Um, now I'm going to throw the question around that we get all the time. I've just been diagnosed or my loved one's just been diagnosed and like what percentage of cases eventually become dementia? Um, you know, obviously Alzheimer's being the most common. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question too. I mean, you know, it's hard to say exact numbers because it is so dependent on what the MCI is, is looking like, right? So MCI is just this sort of broad term that tells us about the, the overall level of impairment, but it doesn't tell us about the symptoms that people are experiencing and in what other context, right? And, and we've already discussed, you know, there are so many contexts that can alter somebody's cognition that may be treatable, um, you know, uh, like mood, sleep, uh, you know, other cardiovascular risk factors, things like that. Um, but in the context of, you know, it being an MCI that are, you know, your um, providers are really suspecting might be due to a neurodegenerative disease, there is a much larger risk for that to progress to dementia. Um, Do we know how, like what the rough percentage is of MCI diagnosis that leads to dementia? Do we know that? You know, there may be epidemiological studies that um, have, you know, estimated those things. I'm, I'm not totally sure on, on the numbers of that. Um, you know, in our clinic, we take things at such a person level approach mm -hmm. um, that, you know, we're sort of taking in all these con context factors that these larger epidemiological studies don't necessarily focus on. So what is your recommendation to the patient population or, um, and their loved ones? If you do receive an MCI diagnosis, do you investigate further and insist on, I mean, you know, I'm talking about MCI due to memory loss um, and, you know, maybe there's just you know, some some scores on the cognitive tests are coming back with a bit of concern, but not anything, you know, major. Um, what should people do? Because a lot of times, you know, they're told, okay, it's MCI, do your best and I'll see you in six months. So, you know, do you have advice to people as to what types of questions they should be asking their doctor and what should they be monitoring or what should they be insisting on for further um, diagnosis? Because 
not every place is going to be a UCSF, right? Um, um, around the country and around the world for that matter. So what is it that we can give to people to understand really what they should be asking for? Yeah, that, I mean, that's another really great point. Um, I'll just, you know, say a little bit of background about why oftentimes physicians will say, you know, we'll hold on to this, come back in six months, we'll evaluate you again, because, you know, that's sort of the best marker to know if there's true change over time is these repeat evaluations. Um, that being said, I think, you know, each patient's own individual experience also tells them whether or not there's been change over time. Um, and being really clear, um, you know, about that with yourself to say, okay, have I experienced these kind of progressive changes in my memory over time? Do I know, do I feel that it's really getting worse? And if you really do, be super clear and communicative about that with your doctor, you know, bring examples, tell them, you know, specific reasons why, why these are concerns to you. And if that's the case, you know, push for further evaluation. Um, you know, any doctor that maybe is telling you to just, you know, forget about it and come back in six months for a reevaluation, um, you can really push for these additional diagnostic tests. And, you know, I think being aware of what exists is step number one, um, so that you can, you know, know what to ask for. Um, so, yeah. so the scan, how does the scanning work? So is that standard care of practice? If you come in saying, I'm, I, I mean, I know you first give cognitive assessments, you understand if there's other things going on, but then would the patient be given an, an MRI um, right away or what, what's the standard care of practice? Not at all clinics. No. Um, and you're right. You know, UCSF is very different. We get uh, brain MRIs on pretty much every um, patient that we see, but that's not a uh, standard of care across the country and across different clinics with different resources. Um, but you can advocate for that, you know, especially if there's an indication um, and your provider can refer you to get um, additional brain scans, uh, get, you know, these fluid biomarker tests through lumbar puncture, um, you know, getting as much comprehensive information as possible for you to know what the next steps are um, so, is really helpful. Um, the diagnostic test, like let's say, and, and you know, the blood tests are coming. We know that, right? right? right. I mean, they're coming. That's going to make it a lot easier for patients to see. But I have a question because we know that there are people who have beta amyloid plaque in their brains who may never get Alzheimer's. And that's just probably a factor of, you know, maybe they didn't hit the, the tipping point before they died and they stayed cognitively healthy. Um, but is there a scenario where you would see plaque, like let's say it, like somebody had a PET scan or scan or a spinal tap, and it was po PET um, positive for for beta amyloid plaque? Would that person ever just have an MCI diagnosis, or at that point would you say, okay, it's early stage Alzheimer's? At that point, somebody could still absolutely have an MCI diagnosis. Again, you know, the MCI is sort of separate from what's causing the cognitive impairment. Um, so if there was evidence that there were beta amyloid plaques, um, at that point, you know, the provider might say this is MCI due to AD um, or due to Alzheimer's disease. And um, only until, you know, a person progresses and can no longer complete those activities of daily living independently, would it be classified as a level of dementia versus MCI. Right. Okay. And we're getting a question in saying, yeah. when are these blood tests going to be available? So let's just take, you only know your <laughs> own world. What is UCSF doing? Are they going to, are you going to have blood tests available to people? I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're using them in some trials, right? Is that true? Yeah. And actually we are starting to roll out blood tests for um, phosphorylated tau, uh, which is an indicator of uh, amyloid, uh, sorry, of of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so we are starting to roll it out. It's, you know, it is more preliminary, but um, I have a question. Starting... Why are you using them for tau and not um, amyloid? I'm just curious. Like, yeah. I'm... So, so the, I know that it's, it's a good question, but the, the, the research in blood is showing that these phosphorylated tau markers are the most indicative 
of Alzheimer's disease in the brain. You know, there's lots of things that can affect what's in our blood and it's not necessarily directly connected to our brain. So we have to find these markers that are more closely correlated with the things that are in our brain. Um, and that's why, you know, the, the lumbar punctures are the, or have been the gold standard because it draws the fluid that is directly surrounding the brain. So we're getting a closer, you know, one-to-one -one connection with the brain as compared to blood. So we kind of have to find all these different markers that closely relate to brain. So, but doesn't tau indicate a later pro progression of the disease? Like you start with the plaque, then you get the tangles? Yeah, so the tau tangles um, represent a stage of Alzheimer's disease that more directly correlates with cognitive functioning, actually. Um, and, uh, but what people are finding in the blood is that our, our markers of tau in blood relate really strongly to amyloid in the brain. Um, so there are lots of studies that are coming out now showing that phosphorylated these phosphorylated tau markers in blood uh, correlate very closely to our amyloid PET scans and the level of amyloid that's detected via PET scans. Um, and so people are really thinking that, it, you know, in the blood that these are markers of amyloidosis. So I'm, I'm assuming if someone has tau, then you're going to say you have all early stage Alzheimer's and not MCI or no? Well, you know, uh, again, I think the tau is another indicator that Alzheimer's disease is in the brain. Um, and the MCI is just characterizing your level of cognitive impairment, regardless of how much protein or if any protein of Alzheimer's disease at all is in there. Um, so someone could absolutely still have tau tangles and be characterized as MCI based on their level of cognitive impairment and level of functioning if they're still independent. Yeah, um, that's, that's, we have a question coming in from Beth who said, I have heard the lack of beta amyloid plaque in an LP may be indicative of Alzheimer's, um, not the presence. Is that true? Yes, yes, exactly. Um, that's exactly right. So lower levels in our fluid indicate that more uh, amyloid is, is accumulating in the brain. So can you have um, plaque swirling around in your bloodstream, um, but it doesn't make it to your brain for, every, for whatever reason? Or if it's in your blood, will it be in your brain? Well, um, the interesting thing is that actually, everybody has amyloid. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's just a part of our normal functioning. You know, there's amyloid in my blood, uh, <laughs> in everybody's blood. Um, the, the problem is when it starts to aggregate in the brain. Um, so that's, you know, the aggregations are the plaques and, um, that's, you know, because it's aggregating, it's not clearing from the brain. That's why we have lower levels in the fluid that indicate Alzheimer's disease plaques are accumulating. Right. Um, so I guess, um, pe someone's asking here if it's, it's a blood test in the, in the brain, the, the through the vein, um, is that how, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, other yeah, exactly. Of... It, would, it would just be a, yeah. a, a typical blood draw, you know, like we would normally get at our, um, PCP appointments to test any other, uh, you know, typical labs like our cholesterol. Um, so it'd be, you know, blood draw drawn the same way. So if I go to UCSF with memory problems and I say, are you going to offer the blood test to everyone or is it just for certain people? Um, so there are certain indications, you know, for example, if, if somebody comes and we find that, um, you know, they're performing pretty normally on testing and that there's a clear indication that there's something else driving this cognitive impairment, for example, you know, a lot of times we get people with sleep apnea who don't know that they have sleep apnea and they're not being treated for it. And, you know, it's really disruptive to their sleep and their day to day. We say, okay, let's treat that first. Um, and then if problems persist, or if, you know, if you're feeling like things are getting worse, then we'll explore these, these diagnostic tests through, through the blood or through the CSF. So, okay, we have also another Chris, Chris Boyce, who's always a, a, a regular viewer of ours, and we appreciate him. Um, okay, the question is, I did the PTAU test three years ago in a clinical trial. Um, they told me higher than normal levels, but being a clinical trial, they couldn't tell me what that meant. So I guess the question being, are there different levels of 
tau once you detect it and does is that associated with memory loss yeah that's that's a really good question so i mean you know that there are, there is this issue in clinical trials where they're not allowed to give you information sometimes um i think there's a, a push away from that where there's yeah we more... hear about that all the time <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly I mean, we're all on board for sharing as much information with the people who are contributing to research as possible you know that's the the, the reason why research happens and advancement happens is because of people's participation so we want to you know give back um but uh to answer the original question um Depending on the, you know, on the, the exact test, there are um, cutoffs that people use to, to, to say whether or not it's an elevated um, or an, sorry, I, I just should say an abnormal um, value. And um, so there are, you know, these sort of established cutoffs. And uh, when it is an abnormal value, there's pretty good sensitivity and specificity to determine that um, Alzheimer's disease is present in the brain. So should patients be insisting? I'm I'm sure not everyone's getting like, oh, here, would you would you like a blood test? Should patients be insisting? I mean, obviously, if they're ready for that type of information, right? But would are they, do you think that it's oh, sorry, I'm getting a call and I don't uh, from my daughter. <laughs> I just, um, um, do you think that that's good enough? Um, like, sh should patients be insisting that yes, I I want a blood test if they're if they really want to know that the beginning hallmarks are present? Yeah, I you know this is an absolutely individual decision. If somebody is really ready and determined to and wanting to know what you know whether or not Alzheimer's disease may be driving their symptoms. Um, I, you know, absolutely. You know, you're, you're, in, you're in control of your healthcare, um, and your provider should be supportive of helping you, you know, achieve these healthcare goals. And if, if part of that is, is gaining more information about what's going on, then, then absolutely. You know, I think oftentimes, um, you know, as, as patients, we have to advocate for ourselves. Um, yeah. so I, you know, I, I would absolutely, you know, support any anything that a, a patient wants to have more information on. Are they covered by insurance right now? Are do you know? um the some of the um lumbar puncture ones are? I I'm not I don't remember if if any of the blood tests are currently covered by insurance, and um. That's okay. I kind of put you yeah. on the spot without telling no, you. No, no, no. Like that, we're that's we're okay. talking a lot about the blood test because yeah. I think there's a lot of interest, but yeah, yeah. you're allowed not to know things because it's a very new technology. <laughs> um, so Emily, give us a cheat sheet of, you know, if you're experiencing memory loss, what are some of the other things that you should consider um, in order to determine whether or not, I mean, you mentioned sleep before, um, what else? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, you know, we're, we're thinking about a lot of different modifiable factors, right? Um, so, of course, there are things that um, to affect our other aspects of health, um, including, you know, these cardiovascular risk factors. I think, um, you know, a, a saying that we often say a lot is a healthy heart is a healthy brain. Um, and so you really want to take control of managing things like blood pressure, um, cholesterol, uh, you know, if there's an indication for diabetes, you won't really want to get that under control. If you have any changes in mood, that can really affect how you function in, in a day-to-day -day life, um, you know, uh, in engaging in treatment for those sorts of things. Um, those can all be really helpful just in not only, you know, improving your own day-to-day -day life, but in determining what is really going on? Because if I treat those things and it gets better, then maybe, you know, that that's kind of a good sign. Do you see a higher association with maybe people um, with memory MCI with people who are overweight or perhaps have diabetes? Yeah, there, there's lots of studies showing that um, those sorts of factors are risks for developing cognitive impairment down the line. And the exact mechanisms for those things, you know, people are still really digging into um, there, I think there are both direct and indirect effects on the brain when we're thinking about things like diabetes, cholesterol, um, and blood pressure in particular. I think high blood pressure has, you know, had one of the strongest correlations with 
um, future cognitive decline. So I know it's it's interesting. I mean, all of this is getting so interesting because the more data we as individuals get about our on our own health, the more we could be proactive. And now you have all these monitors and 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 things like that. Um, so you know, I know that with diabetes, the risk goes up. Diabetes type two, your risk goes up hugely. Um, Seventy five percent, I was told, is like a chance. Um, of developing Alzheimer's if you are diabetic, um, diabetes type two for, um, you know, a, a consistent mm -hmm. period of time, a considerable period of time. So what, if, if you are already experiencing memory loss, but let's say it's brought on by something like cholesterol or, um, you know, glucose levels, uh, metabolism, that type of thing, do we know, is it like Alzheimer's where if the damage has already started in the brain, it's really hard to reverse, but maybe you could slow it down? Or in those cases with lifestyle factors, can we actually reverse that? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So in some ways, you know, some of the research that's been done in this area has shown that, you know, um, once some damage has already been done, it is hard to revert that and, and improve from there. But Treating those, um, you know, medical factors and really getting those stable can can stabilize your cognitive trajectory as well, um, and at least slow any decline. For example, you know, if if Alzheimer's now is on board um, and your diabetes is way out of control, that could potentially accelerate the cognitive decline. But if you if you get your diabetes under control. Um, you know, your glucose levels are stable and really optimal, then that can slow that, that, that decline. Okay. And then how, how long a period is MCI usually? I mean, MCI is like, you're just entering, experiencing um, it typically in patients who um, are later diagnosed with, with early stage Alzheimer's after a MCI, what would you say the general time period for that is? Yeah, it, it really ranges, and it's especially depending on you know what level of MCI people are sort of at. Um, but it can range really anywhere from a year to a couple years. Um, and there are so many factors that can influence this too. You know, I, I work with a lot of people, including some of the research that I do at UCSF, showing that these lifestyle modifications can make a really big difference in the trajectory of of cognitive decline. Um, one of the you know, most important things we often emphasize for people is physically, uh, staying physically active. Um, even you know, something as simple as reducing your sedentary time or the time you just sit all day um, can, can be a step in the right direction. So um, there's, there's quite a range and it's because of some of these individual factors. You know, I've, I've felt that firsthand. I'm a runner. I run usually almost every day, but I can remember things in my mind on my run. Like I've, I've written speeches in my head, you know, and it sticks with me and I can't explain it, but it's like, whenever I have to do something hard, I go on a run and for some reason, my memory is better. And I was like, <laughs> you can't deny that it's happened yes. over and over again. Right. So that yeah. mechanism of memory and exercise, there's got to be a great connection there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and research, you know, shows that consistently time and time again. Some of the people that I work with at UCSF2 are really trying to dig into what are the biological factors that, you know, translates physical activity to these better brain health sort of outcomes. Um, and, I, you know, I think there's a lot of really interesting things going on here in ways that we can uh, tap into those biological mechanisms. Okay, I would love to volunteer for that study. So <laughs> sign me up. <laughs> I've always wanted to do an exercise, you know, because if you're exercising anyway, and frankly, I feel like I have a terrible memory. So, you know, I would love <laughs> to understand that. But actually, this is what I want to end on too. Baseline. How important is baseline to get an accurate? So, you know, me right now, I might have a terrible memory, but I'm healthy and I don't have early stage MCI or Alzheimer's yet, knock on wood. Um, but worry about that because I have a mom with Alzheimer's. Um, should I have a baseline? Then how do I get one? Do I just call UCSF and say, hey, I need a baseline? Or will they be like, no, we're too busy? Like, how do people get baseline cognitive assessments? Yeah, I, I think I do think baselines are really helpful because everyone starts at a different level. Um, and the best comparison is a comparison against yourself. <laughs> um, 
However, you know, you are hitting the nail on the head um, because our clinics are often overrun and really busy. And, you know, if someone calls saying that they don't really have any cognitive concerns, but just want uh, an evaluation to know where they're at, um, that can be really difficult and potentially just not achievable, um, depending on the, on the clinic. So, um, you know, my recommendation would be you know, just keeping an eye on symptoms. And once you start to notice significant changes for yourself, that is the time when, you know, the earliest decline, if we can catch you at a moment when you're having the earliest signs of decline, that can be a pretty close to baseline. Um, so, but what does a baseline assessment look like for a healthy person? Yeah. So, um, you know, again, I'm a neuropsychologist, right? I, I think about this in terms of, you know, how a neuropsychologist would approach it. But um, it would be a comprehensive cognitive evaluation. Um, you know, neuropsychological testing is done with people of all age ranges from kids to adults, older adults. Um, and so we would give, you know, an evaluation that taps into all aspects of functioning like we would with anyone who's coming in with a specific complaint. You would note strengths and weaknesses. And then at a later time point, you'd have the, you know, performance on each of these tests to compare to. Okay, great. Emily, thank you so much. I loved speaking about this topic. I think it's one that deserves a whole lot more time because it's impacting so many people and there's a ton of confusion around it. So thank you so much um, for uh, really sharing your insights and your expertise. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, you know, I'm happy to chat about this anytime and thank you so much for having me here. If you guys have more questions for Emily, just send them to us. We'll pass them along. Um, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter on beingpatient.com. That's when you'll hear about what's coming up. We have a lot of great talks lined up um, like this one. So please join us. And thanks very much for your time today. Speak soon. Bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. For more information on upcoming interviews, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at beingpatient.com. That's B-E-I-N-G-P-A-T-I-E-N-T dot com. And send us any feedback you may have, whether it's someone you want us to interview or any comment about our podcast series. You can do so by emailing info at beingpatient.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. I'm Deborah Kahn.